All right, House of the Dragon, what's it gonna be this week? All right, foot fetish it is. Yes, this episode has all the foot rubbing action that would make even Quentin Tarantino blush. Look at that, don't that look wonderful? If you really pay me enough, we'll massage your feet in any of these sauces also. Honestly, my intros get worse every week. Well, if that doesn't Loris your strong, how about Kid Fight Club? You do not talk about Fight Club. In this video, there are some absolutely huge differences from the book, which may have implications for the entire season going forward. We'll also be looking at Easter eggs, connections to the book, and a whole lot more. But be sure to like and subscribe, as tomorrow I'll be coming out with my preview breakdown, which will have tons of spoilers. If you've been an insane person like me and watch the intro credits every week, you'll have noticed slight changes from episode to episode. For example, King Viserys' sigil can now be seen overtaken by blood, which is something reserved only for those characters who have died. This is the first episode where we get to see Alicent's bloodline more closely. Here is Alicent with the high tower of Old Town in front of the seven-pointed Star of the Faith. Her blood flows downward toward her four children, Aegon, Aemond, Helena, and Daeron. Now you might be asking yourself, where is this missing fourth child? How come we haven't seen him yet? That would be because he's not even in King's Landing, having taken up the position as squire for Alicent's cousin Lord Ormond Hightower in Old Town. The sigils for each child are pretty straightforward. A spider for Helena, whose love for insects extends even to her embroidery, a woman bound, Aegon's penchant for doing things to women against their will, and a sapphire for Aemond, who in the book is said to have put this gem in place of his missing eye. Unfortunately, we can't really make out Daeron's, but we'll probably get that in season two when it's said his character will appear. Now skip ahead about 30 seconds if you don't want a a minor spoiler regarding King Aegon and Helena's children. We do see a bloodline flowing downward from King Aegon II to their three children, Jaehaerys, Jahara, and Maelor. Jaehaerys, of course, named after Viserys' grandfather who named him King after the Great Council. He and Jahara were twins, which would explain their identical sigils. This one was a bit more difficult, and let me know if I'm wrong here, but since we travel down from Daemon, I'm assuming these two are his two sons with Rhaenyra, Aegon the Younger and Viserys, who we saw briefly in last episode. There is a third child on the way, as we do see Rhaenyra was pregnant last episode. A dark throne sits empty for the first time in 26 years, the length of King Viserys's reign. The keep is quiet and dark, save for a servant boy emerging from the king's chambers. It's never mentioned what this kid was doing there, but since he works under Alicent's handmaiden Talia, who in turn works for the White Worm Messaria, it's a safe bet he was tasked with checking on the king at Talia's behest. There's a lot to be gained by being the first to know of the king's demise. And can I just say I loved getting a glimpse of the quiet castle, but down below you have all the servants already prepping for the day? It's these small details that really get me immersed in the world. Talia tells the queen of her husband's passing. This has been a long time coming, and Alison asks that she stay confined to this room. That will be a big theme throughout the episode, keeping the death of the king a secret until Alison and the Greens can sort everything everything out. Talia will use her time in the Queen's chambers to light some candles near the window, a sign to Masaria below that the King has passed. This is how Masaria was able to grab Aegon and hide him in the Sept. I also found it pretty ironic that Masaria used her knowledge of Aegon's whereabouts to make a deal with Otto to shut down that toddler UFC, when it was Aegon who loved frequenting them. More on why Masaria asked for this in a bit. A distraught Alicent picks at her nails, something that's been a sign of her anxiety throughout the entire season. She tells her father, Hand of the King Otto Hightower, that on his deathbed, King Viserys wished for Aegon to be king. And Otto is sitting there like, Tell me more, tell me more. This statement is categorically untrue. Not once did the king say he wished Aegon to be king. Viserys, in his delirium from drinking milk of the poppy and likely half dead, was referring to Aegon the Conqueror. In episode one, we learned of Aegon's prophecy which foretold of a Targaryen ruler needed to unite the realm against an upcoming evil, a nod to the Night King and his army of the dead which won't appear for about another 150 years. In fact, the Cat's Paw Dagger which tells this prophecy when 
been heated by flame is the very dagger that will end up killing the Night King. So Alicent ends up interpreting Viserys' mumbo jumbo as him wanting Aegon, their son, on the throne. The small council has been summoned, and considering the name of this episode is the Green Council, it becomes quickly apparent why. In attendance are Jasper Wilde, Master of Laws, Grand Maester Orwile, Lyman Beesbury, Master of Coin, Tylan Lannister, Master of Ships, Hand of the King Otto Hightower, Sir Christian Cole, and Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, Sir Harold Westerling. Otto begins the meeting by declaring the death of King Viserys, who he calls the Peaceful. Pretty ironic considering the bloodshed his death is about to cause. It's also interesting because Viserys was so concerned how the people would remember him, and it seems Otto has made that decision. He'll later refer to the former king as Viserys the Peaceful in his speech to the common folk at the Dragon Pit. We've never got an explanation as to the purpose of these marble balls that indicate a member's attendance to the council. They're not mentioned in the book. But Otto does something interesting here. Only after he tells the council of King Viserys' last wish does he put the ball in its holder. Almost as if when the ball is in, they're on record and out off the record. If you think they're used for something else, let me know in the comments. Ravens are to be sent to green allies in River Run and High Garden, giving them advanced warning to prepare, and it seems as though every member on the council, minus Alicent and Lyman Beesbury, has been planning for this event, with Otto immediately demanding that two captains of the City Watch, still loyal to Damon, be replaced. Remember that Damon used to command them. It's absolutely crazy to think that the the friggin' queen was not let in on this treacherous plan, something she'll no doubt resent. Tylan Lannister would no doubt be on Team Green. His brother Jason, after all, was snubbed by Rhaenyra as a potential husband, and Tylan's advice was often overlooked by the old king, such as what to do in the Stepstones. He tells Otto that the treasury will be divided for safekeeping, which is something that's news to Master of Coin, Lyman Beesbury. He calls this whole thing treason. Hundreds of lords pledged their fealty to Lady Rhaenyra, and now we're supposed to believe the king's dying words to a queen who seeks to put her son on the throne? It's possible that Lyman could have made it out of this meeting alive if it weren't for his accusation that one of them, including Alicent, poisoned the king. Something her sworn protector, Sir Kristen Cole, does not take too kindly to, smashing his head into the table and killing him. The book offers three different accounts as to how this went down. One, that Lyman was taken to the dungeon where he died of a chill. Two, that Sir Kristen Cole stabbed him in the throat. And three, that Kristen flung him out of a window, but they all agree that Lyman Beesbury was the first to perish in the Dance of Dragons, the civil war that's to brew between the Alicent's Team Green and Rhaenyra's Team Black. Beesbury's death is enough for Harold Westerling to demand Sir Kristen remove his sword and cloak. And Tyler tries to get out of the way like, Yeah, uh... Let me get out of your way. Or while the man of medicine that he is thinks it's best to remove Beesbury's body. But Otto stresses the importance of keeping everyone there. Every moment Rhaenyra does not know of her father's passing is a moment they can organize their forces. A vital ally for the Greens would be House Baratheon at Storm's End, led by Boros, the son of Borman Baratheon who we saw in Episodes 1 Tournament and also in Episode 5 during Rhaenyra's search for a suitor. It can be inferred that sometime between Episode 5 and 9 that Borman died leaving Storm's End to Boros and his four daughters. If Boros were offered Aemond or Daeron to wed one of his daughters, it may sway him to join the Greens. Alicent feels trapped. Everything is out of her control. Renice believes the Queen's desire is not to be free, but to make a window in the wall of her prison. We saw some amazing framing in Episode 8 that showed her like a caged bird. One of the main conflicts between Alicent and her father is what's to be done with Rhaenyra. Alicent wants to give her fair terms to bend the knee. In the book, it is said that if Rhaenyra bent the knee, she'd be able to keep Dragonstone to pass it on to Jace, while Driftmark would pass on to Luke. In the show, Otto orders Harold Westerling to take the Kingsguard to Dragonstone and have Rhaenyra and her kin killed. In the book, Harold is never in this meeting and died more than a decade earlier, with Kristen having already been replaced as Lord Commander for several years. So when Harold Westerling removes his cloak not wanting to undertake these orders from someone other than the King, we aren't sure what happens to him. He just kind of walks away. I like to imagine he's on the beach enjoying pina coladas, enjoying his retirement. That or getting rowdy on the Street of Silk. As morning dawns, Helena watches over her two children, Jaharis and Jahara, who we mentioned earlier. Alicent has come with the news that her father has died, and she demands to know where Aegon is. Helena here lets out one of her cryptic lines, the same one we heard her mutter in episode 8 at dinner. Your father, there is a beast beneath the 
Elena is no stranger to these cryptic prophecies. In episode 6, she said that Aemon will have to, quote, close an eye when he rides a dragon. And in episode 7, she says, quote, hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh, weaving dragons of thread, foreshadowing the dance of dragons. If you want to find out who this beast beneath the boards is, make sure you're subscribed for when I come out with my preview breakdown videos, which are filled with spoilers. Aemon is also here, and as we'll see in his storyline this episode, this is a man who wants to be king, while his brother Aegon doesn't want it. I also like how the production design team made these sweet seven-pointed star candle holders. Otto visits Sir Eric Cargill, the sworn protector of Prince Aegon. He has a twin brother whose name sounds very similar, Arik with an A. I would hate growing up in that house. In the book, even the fellow Kingsguard couldn't tell these two apart, and I think that's what the writers are trying to do here. So if I screw up an Eric with an Arik, you can feed me to the dragons. The prince evaded Eric's protection, and now Otto has tasked him and his brother with retrieving the future king. Alicent will task Kristen and Aemon with this as well, because whoever gets their hand on Aegon may wind up determining the fate of Rhaenyra and the war to come. There's also this really weird moment in the scene where Alicent whispers to Kristen outside of Aemon's earshot, Everything you feel for me is your queen. Did any of you think that was weird too? And if the King's Landing hospitality couldn't get any worse, Rhaenys is awakened to find herself locked in her room. She clearly showed her allegiance to Rhaenyra last episode by siding with Luke's claim to the Driftwood throne, so Alicent has her locked away until she agrees to side with the Greens. Through her window, she can see other lords and ladies ushered away, likely to the Great Hall where Otto will demand they swear fealty to Aegon. If you look really closely, you can see Grand Maester Orwell, Jasper, and Tylan scheming here off to the side. Meanwhile, Talia and other servants are brought to the dungeon. In the book, those deemed to be loyal to Rhaenyra were brought here to be imprisoned or even killed. With Loras creeping around here and knowing that Talia was one of Masaria's informants, I think it's safe to say he was involved in her capture. Her being Alicent's trusted handmaiden, she otherwise wouldn't have been there. Later in the episode, when Lord Caswell is caught fleeing to inform Rhaenyra, he calls Loras Lord Confessor, which I believe is the first time Loras has been referred to as as such. In the book, that is his title, and it's meant for the royal torturer. He also served as Master of Whisperers under both Viserys and Aegon II, however, we've yet to see him officially in that capacity. Aemon knows all of his brother's favorite hangout spots in King's Landing. In fact, it was Aegon who brought Aemon to the Street of Silk on his 13th birthday to lose his virginity. They'll actually interview the woman he lost it to. How you've grown. Unfortunately, Aegon has not visited the brothel. As we'll find out later, he enjoys a very different type of entertainment. In the Great Hall, Otto demands the lords pledge their fealty to Aegon, but not all of them believe Viserys changed his mind on his deathbed. Among them is Lord Merryweather of Long Table, a noble house from the Reach. You can tell by the house sigil on his necklace. In the book, he along with Lady Fell and Lord Caswell languish in the dungeons for some time and are given one last chance to swear fealty to Aegon. When they refuse, they're beheaded. Now Caswell here, knowing his neck's on the line, originally swears fealty, but if you notice, Lars is off to the the side watching everyone, and if I'm Laris and see this look on a dude's face, I'll definitely be keeping an eye on him. Aemon suggests that Aegon, not wanting to be king, is probably halfway to Yeeti by now. Yeeti is a far eastern civilization yet to be seen in the show, however there's apparently an animated spin-off called the Golden Empire currently in the works that's set there. The Cargill twins have found their way to Kids Fight Club. Eric uses this opportunity to show his brother how cruel the future king really is even having his bastard children fight, although it's debatable whether he actually knows they're his bastards. Remember, it was Eric who informed the queen of Aegon's abuse of Diana. As his sworn protector, he probably knows all the evil shit this kid's gotten up to. Arik will counter, saying none of that matters. This is their sworn duty. So I think this is what will eventually set these two brothers apart, honor versus duty. Bonus points if you've got the kids wearing house emblems on the back of their rags. Out of the blue, Jane, one of Masaria's underlings, informs the twins she knows where Aegon is, but if they want to know, they'll have to arrange a meeting between Otto and the White Worm herself. Speaking of Otto, he thanks Loras, who caught Lord Caswell trying to escape, but there's also a veiled threat here when Otto notices Loras has spent, quote, many hours with the Queen, and Loras doesn't deny it, saying, There's no reason those hours cannot in the end benefit you. This is what makes Laris so dangerous. In the book, the historians never really knew what side Laris was playing. 
The Silent Sisters prepare Viserys' body. In the book, it was days before they were even allowed to begin their work as the body sat rotting. Alicent lays the crown atop his corpse, as Aegon will be taking a different crown, that of Aegon the Conqueror, when he ascends. Rhaenys credits Alicent for her boldness when she comes with her terms. Join her in the greens, and she may have Driftmark if she so wishes. And Alicent has some good arguments here. Rhaenys supported the Targaryens her entire life, and look what it got her, a dead daughter in Pentos and a cuckolded son. But perhaps there's something that's pissed Rhaenys off more than anything, and that's that her life and Alicent's have been dictated entirely by men. Rhaenyra would be the first female ruler, and that's something Alicent can't offer. Has Alicent never imagined how things would be different if she were on the throne? Kristen and Aemond watch on as Otto meets with Missaria. Otto knows she's not bullshitting him, as she knows the king is dead. In exchange for the prince's whereabouts, she asks for the end of the abhorrent treatment of children in Flea Bottom, where members of the Gold Cloaks are bribed to look the other way. For Missaria, this is personal. She grew up in a world of child slaves, brothels, and violence. Sold countless times and used his property, she knows what it's like. In episode 2, she even tells Damon that she came to him not for gold, power, or station, but to be liberated. By making this deal with Otto, she is hoping to give these children something Damon could not give her. Liberation from fear. Otto knows that Missaria could have just easily had Aegon killed, and takes her up on the offer, promising that he will remember these terms once Aegon comes to power. And Aegon is in a spot you'd least likely find him, a sept, the same one his mother and Rhaenyra prayed at as children. In the book, Aegon is found passed out naked in a flea-bottom rat pit where he is picked up by Sir Criston. No battle takes place between him and Arik. It's in this scene that Eric defects, going against both Otto's orders and turning against his brother. We'll later see him as the one who helps Rhaenys escape. Alicent now has the upper hand. Whoever controls Aegon can dictate what happens next. Whatever their differences, Otto wants the two to be as one, but Alicent isn't sure that's true. Alicent wants fair terms sent to Rhaenyra, but Otto, being the realist that he is, says if she lives, her allies will rally behind her, looking for her return. All Alicent wants is to allow Rhaenyra the chance to to save herself, and Otto questions if this sentiment is coming from what Viserys would have wanted, or Alicent herself. In addition, Alicent wants Kristen Cole named Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and for Aegon to be coronated tomorrow morning with all of King's Landing in attendance. He'll also wear Aegon's crown and wield his sword Blackfire, the same sword we saw Viserys hold. The scene ends rather creepily, with Otto telling his daughter she looks so much like her mother in certain lights. Perhaps he admires the strength she finally shows playing the Game of Thrones, but for me I just found it weird. Remember in episode 1 he told her to wear one of her mother's dresses after he tasked her with cozying up with the king. Speaking of creeps, Loras always manages to find himself in the queen's chambers. It seems as though his information now comes at a cost, with Alicent having to provide him a free OnlyFans subscription. I think it's kind of ironic that the guy who can't use his foot has a foot fetish. He tells her that within the castle is a web of spies. Otto has used this web to his advantage. For example, that's how he found out about Rhaenyra's tryst with her uncle in episode 4. The only way to destroy this web is to kill the Weaver, who I believe to be Missaria. And Loras can do this for her if she wishes. Of course that comes with a far greater, much stickier price. I am never going to financially recover from this. Rhaenys, still imprisoned and thinking whether or not she'll accept Alicent's offering, is awoken in the middle of the night by Eric. He's come to help her escape. I found something really interesting with Sir Eric, his super cute man purse. This is an item he's not wearing in his first scene with Otto. I actually have a theory as to what's inside it, but I'll save that for my preview breakdown. Hint, I mentioned it in this video. We see Lord Caswell hung in the courtyard to be made an example of those who defy the king. There's also this lingering shot of Rhaenys looking upon the skull of Balerion. She would have been alive when Viserys rode him back in the day, and it's also a reminder that her own dragon, Melis, is over at the dragon pit. However, with this escape, it's too dangerous to claim her. The two make their way up the same passage Rhaenyra and Daemon used in episode 4. They're on their way to Blackwater Bay to presumably gain passage to Dragonstone. And it looks like Loras has already got his plans underway to chop the head off the weaver as we see Missaria's home burning. This was likely committed by one of his tongueless cloaked henchmen, who also created that fire that killed Harwin and Lionel Strong. We're not sure if Missaria actually dies in this fire, but all I'll say is that this does not happen in the book. 
Eric and Renice are split apart from one another as a deluge of citizens are forced to attend the King's Ascension, kind of like those mandatory school assemblies. The book actually offers differing accounts of how many attended, one stating that it was packed to the brim and another that barely half of the arena was filled. As preparations are made, we get a brief glimpse of this prayer to the seven above, which has this really cool Easter egg talking about a cataclysm on a sept that resulted in the creation of the Dragon Pit. Before the Dragon Pit sat a building called the Sept of Remembrance, which King Magor the Cruel burned down using Balerion's Dragon Flame during an event known as the Faith Militant Uprising. A few years later, the Dragon Pit as we know it would be built atop these ruins. Even as his carriage makes its way to the pit, Aegon does not want to be king stating that his father had 20 years to do so, but never did. What we'll see between now and the end of the episode is Aegon going from, I don't want it, to, this is kinda cool. All it takes is offering that sweet cat's paw dagger and the roar of some adoring fans, and pretty soon he's getting everyone all worked up, and I kinda felt like he was enjoying it. But before we get to that, Alicent tells Aegon that Otto will try to convince him to kill Rhaenyra, but to reject that. He doesn't even answer her, asking instead if she loves him, to which she says, you imbecile. A big leap from last episode where she said he's not her son. As people attend the Travis Scott concert and crammed into the dragon pit, Otto announces that the king has died and that his final wish was for Aegon to be king. At first people are like, I don't know about this, Wayne. But slowly they give in to uproarious applause. Most common folk always wanted a male to be king and we saw this play out in episode four. Or would she be feeble? Aegon is brought forth under this cool procession of saluting swords, and my god, every entrance in this damn show is just so friggin' epic. In attendance are Kristen, Grand Maester Orwile, Jasper Wilde, Tylan Lannister, Aemond, Helena, Alicent, and Otto. Not here is Aegon's younger brother Daeron, who will be squiring in Old Town at the moment, and whom I'm told will appear in Season 2. The Targaryen emblem here is also gold instead of a traditional red. It is said that when Aegon took the crown, he switched it to gold, which would also match his gold dress. Dragon, Sunfire. Rhaenys Irish goodbyes the Ascension while Aegon is anointed with the Seven. In the book, this is done by Septon Eustace, who happens to be one of the sources from the book Fire and Blood. That being said, Rhaenys flying out of the Dragon Pit on Baelise, killing hundreds and escaping, does not happen in the book, but damn does it make for some good TV. But first, just like in the book, Aegon is crowned by Kristen Cole with the red ruby adorned crown of the Conqueror. As he's presented to the people, they're a bit hesitant at first, but go along with it. Aegon Aegon really gets into it, thrusting the air with his sword of Blackfire. But with any happy event in the Game of Thrones universe, you know it'll be short-lived. Maelise breaks through the pit, absolutely crushing those around her. As much as I hate Alicent, shout out to her for immediately getting in front of her son to protect him. But here's what I found most interesting, and arguably one of the most debated and controversial changes from the book. Rhaenys has the opportunity to kill basically all the Greens here and prevent the upcoming civil war. All she to do was yell Dracarys, but she doesn't. She lets them live. Because this is not in the book and the episode essentially ends here, all we can really do is speculate until next week. No doubt Rhaenyra will want to know why she didn't off them. I have two theories here which will probably get disproven next episode. One is that for the first time, Rhaenys gets to make her own decision. She may be the queen who never was, but in this moment she holds all authority over those in front of her. She is showing the queen she would have been by sparing them. The second theory, and not my favorite, is that she's waiting on what to do until she hears from Corlys. Last episode, we heard he was a few days away from arriving at Driftmark after suffering a serious injury at sea. Maybe she wants to consult with him on which side to join, but I like the first theory better. A quick update, I did just watch the behind the scenes footage where showrunners Ryan Condal and Miguel Sapochnik state that it's Renice's moral standpoint that prevents her from killing them. She does not want to kill another mother. Whether you agree with that decision or not is a whole other question, but I'll leave a link to the behind the scenes video in the description for those of you who are interested. And the episode ends with Melise flying off to freedom, leaving Alicent and Aegon in the darkness of the dragon pit. It's also ironic since Renice told Alicent she was basically a prisoner herself. However, Renice ends up free and Alicent with the gate of the dragon pit hiding her in darkness. Now we only have one more episode to go until the finale, which means one more preview breakdown which should be up within 24 hours of this video. If you like the video and my work on this series, it really helps me out if you give it a like and leave a comment. Thanks for watching everyone, and for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. 
Until next time, remember. Yeah, that look wonderful. If you really pay me enough, we'll massage your feet in any of these sauces also.